This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel according to John in the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. And then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, And he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. He said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Does anybody know what the Pygmalion effect is? Does anybody know what the Pyg- what's the Pygmalion effect? You would be the only person all morning long that has... You got it? I know you're nervous now. And you, Googling it is fine. It's allowed if you're... So it's basically um, expectations impact performance. What you expect will impact the outcome that you get. So Pygmalion, um, is, it's named after this figure from Roman mythology. Pygmalion is a sculptor and apparently creates this statue of a woman that is so gorgeous that he falls in love with this statue. And he just he shuns all other human contact and just has eyes only for the statue that he has created. Pygmalion then apparently goes to uh, talk to the goddess Aphrodite about this issue, and uh, she has sort of pity on him and, and brings the statue to life so that they can live, I guess, happily ever after. I don't really know how the story ends, but it seems like it would be one, one of those Disney kind of things. So his expectations, right, literally in that myth, transformed this person. So Pygmalion then is also the title of a George Bernard Shaw play that was turned into a musical called My Fair Lady. And uh, so the person in question, Eliza Doolittle, is a normal person on the street, nobody special. She sells flowers. And Professor Higgins, in all his 
arrogance and self-centeredness says, I can transform this person into a right proper lady uh, and, uh, and pass her off in high society, right? So I can teach her everything she needs to know. All it is is uh, the right language, you know, the right accent, the right terminology, the right uh, costume, never hurts, uh, the right costume, and, and she will, she'll pass off as, as a high society lady. So he takes Eliza Doolittle, this, this really just random person, nobody at all. This, she's uneducated, she's dirty, she's just selling flowers. Ah, you know, she's just a hideous creature. And uh, that's a line, I think, actually in the show. Uh, and, uh, and, and he transforms her right into this beautiful, high society, proper lady. But of course, in, in, the, in the plot, and as the story goes along, we learn that it's so much more than the right costume and the right terminology and the right sort of etiquette and knowing which fork to use for which course, that it has much more to do with, with one's expectations, with one's perceptions. And she says... Um, the difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves, but how she is treated, how she is known. Right? Colonel Pickering treats her like a lady, and so she is one. Professor Higgins treats her like a flower girl, and so for him, she will always be a flower girl. Right? Our expectations... But the Pygmalion effect is more than just uh, in, on stage and in mythology. It's also known as the Rosenthal effect. Now, Rosenthal is a sociologist and uh, did an experiment in which the, the researchers gave a test to every student at this elementary school. Every grade got this baseline test. It was a you know, prior knowledge kind of test. Let's test you to see what you know at the beginning of the year. That's all it was. But they told the teachers that this was a special kind of test, that the test was actually able to predict which students were just about ready to learn. They were uh, bloomers, right? These students this year are going to learn so much. And this test has revealed to us that they are primed, right? So, so these are the students. And they identified them. 20% of every class randomly selected, right? This test didn't really do that. They just told the teachers that the teachers could expect these students to learn a lot more than their peers. At the end of the year, they gave the students the same test. Guess which group of students learned the most that year? That 20%, completely randomly selected 20% of the students who the teachers expected to learn more. It seems like the teacher's expectations impacted how the teachers actually treated those students and how they actually taught them, which is kind of a tragic thing to realize, right? It's kind of tragic to realize that our expectations of another person can really have impact, real life impact. It's not just for learning either. It's not just for positive things. It works for pain as well. I read about this research that's a little a project even more horrifying than this one where uh, the subjects were strapped into this device. I don't know exactly, but apparently on their leg, there was this device that would heat up and inflict pain on them. I'm assuming uh, they had signed a waiver of some kind before this <laughs> experiment happened. So they, it would inflict pain, and in between each session, that's what it sounded like, they, they, they would give them a prep time, right? So they would give them a, a prep moment, and then they would turn on the device. And then they would give them a little bit longer prep moment, and then the pain would be a little bit more intense. And then they gave them a little bit longer moment, and the pain would be even more intense. And they repeated this cycle so that the subjects were trained to experience more pain, or to expect more pain, when the prep time was longer. Well... At the end of their training time, they did the same thing, except as the prep time got longer, the pain level did not increase. The people who were experiencing it, though, reported that they felt the pain increase. Why did they 
experience more pain because they were expecting there to be more pain. Expectations shape reality. Our expectations impact our experiences. And that is, I think, especially true on Easter. Because resurrection, one of the most important parts of the resurrection is its profound unexpectedness. Mary went to that tomb and expected it to be closed. Mary went to that tomb and she expected it to be occupied. John doesn't tell us why she went. Some of the other Gospels say that the women went to prepare the body. John, that's not important to John. Um, it is important to John to tell us that Mary was by herself for some reason. The only Gospel to give us to tell us that. Uh, so she's walking in the morning. It's still dark. And, and, and heading for this tomb that she thinks is sealed. That she thinks is occupied. She's expecting what exactly? What is she expecting to be there. What, as she's wa- I mean, she's the one who has stuck with him, remember? Mary's the hero. She's the one who's been with Jesus throughout the whole crucifixion at the foot of the cross even. She doesn't leave him, and maybe that's it. Maybe it's, all right, uh, Sabbath is over, so now I'm going to go. I need to be by him some more. I need to be close to him some more. And so she just goes, sh- what does she expect? We don't know. We don't know what she expected to happen. But it wasn't this. It wasn't an open door. She gets there and she encounters that and she, what's going on? It's confusing. It's, it's upsetting. And so she runs and gets some of her friends. You got to come check this out. You got to, I don't know, maybe they took the body. I, something's going on. And so, so they run over there and Simon Peter and another disciple and they sort of pop their head in and, yep, you're right. And they leave. I'm so unhelpful. I mean, Men, you know, <laughs> they, they literally, I mean, they read the story. They're like, look in there. Yep, sure. He's gone. Um, uh, I'm out of here. I'm leaving. But, but, ah, but not Mary. Mary stays. Mary sticks. She is crying. She is confused. She has no idea what has happened or what is going to happen. But for some reason, she stays. She expects what? She she expects something. Her expectation compels her to stay. If you want something done, I guess you got to do it yourself. So, So... She looks in, and when she does, she sees something in there that wasn't there before. These two angels, these two messengers, sitting there where the body was. And they ask her the dumbest question in the whole Bible. Why are you crying? (laughs) I mean, really? Come on. Jesus is... The cross and the thing and the berry and I'm, he's gone and I, why are you crying? So she turns around and, and it's dark and she's upset and there are tears blurring her vision and it's out of context so she doesn't recognize him. She thinks it's the gardener. If you took him, where is he? I'll take the body. It doesn't make any sense. Why would the gardener have taken the body? I, but, but if you, I want, what's going on? What does she expect? What does she expect there? And he just calls her name out. Mary. Oh. It's you. Oh, you know me. And I know you. Did she expect that? See, expectation doesn't mean we know exactly what's going to happen next. That's that's certainty. That's not expectation. It was expectation that made her stay, even though she didn't know what was going to happen next. What do we 
risk when we lose that sense of expectation and replace it with certainty, especially on Easter. What, what do we lose in the resurrection story when we know what's going to happen already? When we show up on Easter morning expecting the tomb to be empty, you know, we, got, we have our Easter expectations. What did you expect when you got up this morning? Did you expect there to be flowers in the sanctuary, beautiful spring flowers? Yes. Did you expect there to be Easter lilies? And then you remembered, oh, Andy's allergic to Easter lilies. So, Did you expect there to be trumpets in the worship service? Did you expect your bow tie to fit to your neck? And Because it's Easter, you got to wear a bow tie for some reason. Right, Chris? You got to have... Is the ham now, even now, in the oven, just getting all nice and, right? We ha- it's Easter. You're all eating ham, right? It's a thing. You, Jesus doesn't come back to life unless you eat ham today. <laughs> we have this, see, Easter's about expectation, and we've replaced that with certainty. Like, I know what's going to happen. I know this is it. I know, I know, I know, I know. But, but we don't. Really, we need to show up on Easter expecting the tomb to still be occupied and being confused about why it's not. We, we would love to be the angels in this story, right? Because the angels are certain. The angels who are sitting in there, um, they know, they got the insider information, right? Why are you crying? Huh? He's alive, huh? right? We, we want to know, hey, he's alive. We got this. I'm so certain, right? Or you, we could be the guys too, right? We could be the, the guys, run up to the tomb, take a peek. Oh, uh, nope. I'm going to go have some ham. I'm just, it's all, you guys take care of that, right? We'd love to do that. Take a peek at resurrection. Take a little, just a little glimpse and then head back to safety. Head back to home and lock it up and eat our Cadbury cream eggs for the rest of the afternoon. We'd, that'd be great. But we're not the angels in the story. We're not the guys either. Most of the time, we're Mary. Because we don't know. None of us does. We don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know where life goes from here. There's going to be confusion. There's going to be pain. There's going to be grief. The world is a violent place. There is going to be uncertainty. There, guarantee you, there will be tears in your eyes that cloud your vision. Stay anyway. Stay. Expectancy, the the expectation of resurrection doesn't clear up what's going to happen next. It impels us, it compels us to stay. What happens when you stay? What happens when you stay there? You see Jesus. You might not know what's going to happen next, but expectation means something is. This isn't it. This isn't the end. This isn't how the story ends right here, right now. There's more than this. I don't know what it is, but I know it is something. Stay. Stay in the middle of it. Stay in the middle of the pain and the grief. Stay in the middle of the confusion, and I promise you, you will see Jesus. Expectation is not just for, for Easter morning. Resurrection isn't just for today. This, this hope can impact every single day of your life because every day will have a challenge. Every day will have a goal to set. Every day will bring its own pain, its own disappointments. Expect something. Expect resurrection. Know that this isn't it. Accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Martin Luther King Jr. See, it's a trap. It's a trap to think that Easter morning means certainty about the future. Because certainty is not the same thing as expectation. Mary Magdalene in that tomb, in that garden, she grabbed a hold of death itself, looked it right in the eye and said, I do not know what's coming next. (laughs) But I know this is not the end. 
That's our lives. That's what we do. That's where the hope of Easter comes. And that's a pretty good measure to determine whether the church of Jesus Christ is doing its job in the world. If, if our words and our actions leave expectation behind them, if our words and our actions generate that kind of expectancy that Easter morning brings. We, we've spent this whole season meeting the people who are closest to Jesus and realizing how powerful it is to be known by the Savior and to know Him, getting to know Him more and more. And, and it's such a beautiful thing that, that everything clicks in for Mary when He says her name, when she realizes that He knows her. <laughs> and that she knows him. That's, that's all that religion is, by the way. Knowing the divine and being known in return. That's what faith is. Therein lies our expectancy. Not that we know exactly what the future holds, but we know Jesus. No, let me say that again. No, we do not know exactly what the future holds, but we know Jesus. And most importantly, we are known by him. He calls each one of us by name. There's our hope. That's what Easter is all about. When we think we've experienced the absolute worst that life has to offer, God turns it around. No matter what has happened before, we can start again. Let's pray. This is not the end, God. This isn't all there is. We know that. We know that today more than ever. Our expectation lies in you. Our hope lies in your promise. And as we stand, as we stick, as we stay here in the midst of this life, God, we pray for an encounter with you in which you will call us by name and give us that assurance of resurrection no matter what has happened, the promise that we can start again. We love you and lift our prayers to you in the name of Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.